Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am Adam Lupel, IPI Vice President, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our fourth annual side event to the High Level Forum on the Culture of Peace, Learning Interrupted, Education, COVID-19, and the Culture of Peace, organized in partnership with the Office of the President of the United Nations General Assembly. Around um, the UN, September in New York means the end of one session of the General Assembly and uh, the opening of the next. But it also means the start of the new academic year, back to school for scores of children and youth in New York and around the world. Both of these facts have, of course, been greatly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. So both the annual high-level forum on the culture of peace and the opening of the 75th General Assembly later this month will be mostly virtual. And students all over the world are dealing with uncertainty about what their education in the coming months will entail. Um, my own daughter, I'm a parent, as, as I'm sure uh, many of you are, my own daughter will be starting eighth grade in a matter of days in the New York City public school system. And she remains um, anxious, uncertain about whether she wants to attend class in person, uh, part-time or remain all remote as so many others. It is um, an anxious time to say the least for students, parents, teachers, school staff and administrators uh, all around the world. And to make matters worse, in many contexts, education in the age of the coronavirus has become politicized, exacerbating divisions and inhibiting rational policymaking. So clearly, uh, I think we could all benefit from a recommitment to pursue a culture of peace. The concept of the culture of peace was introduced in the multilateral system in 1992 in the program of the UN Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO. Uh, the United Nations in a series of resolutions and programs looking ahead to the 21st century called for a transition from the culture of war to a culture of peace. And in 1999, the UN General Assembly adopted the Declaration and Program of Action on a Culture of Peace. Much like the holistic nature of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the Program of Action adopted by the General Assembly in 1999 identified eight pillars of the Culture of Peace that are interrelated and interdependent and education was first among them. Acknowledging that achieving peace requires not just preventing violence, but also supporting the structures, attitudes, and institutions that underpin a sustainable, peaceful environment. Through education, we teach children not to hate, said Ban Ki-moon to the opening session of the General Assembly High Level Forum on the Culture of Peace in 2012. Uh, through, in, uh, through education, he said, we can seek to raise leaders who act with wisdom and compassion. Through education, we work to establish a true lasting culture of peace and understanding. So we have to ask what happens when education is interrupted on such a large scale in so many countries around the world, uh, as many as 188 countries, according to UNICEF. And according to UNESCO, uh, 1 billion students worldwide have faced school closures this year or um, continue to face uncertainty about their education in the coming months. What will be the long-term impact on these children and youth how will it affect social, political, and economic development? Already, concerns have been raised that interrupted learning exacerbates inequalities of all kinds, including economic, gender, and nutritional inequalities. So what can we do to mitigate these risks? We have a uh, 
great panel to discuss all of this. Um, there's a lot to talk about. Um, and I will introduce the panel in just a moment. But uh, first, we have a couple of opening remarks. First, we have opening remarks from His Excellency Tihani Mohammed Banda, President of the 74th Session of the United Nations General Assembly. Um, Mr. President, the, uh, the virtual floor is yours. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm highly delighted to welcome you all to this third event. COVID-19, the subject of interest, is a calamity unlike any other. There is no region of the world that is immune to its destructive impact, from the way we conduct ourselves in workplaces and office elevators, to how we interact with one another in shopping malls and in public squares. We have had to be mindful of the protocol that the fast spreading and deadly outbreak decree. The education sector has been particularly destabilized by the pandemic. COVID-19 has ravaged the world and disrupted learning opportunities of students around the world, particularly those in technologically disadvantaged regions. Even before the onset of COVID-19, the world was faced with a learning crisis. The latest review of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable De Development indicates that the world is not on track to attain goal number four, inclusive quality education. The 2019 High Level Political Forum noted that one in three children in the Africa region did not finish primary school. Only 20 million of 158 million children in Sub-Saharan Africa meet the minimum proficiency levels in reading and mathematics. Then came COVID-19 and the education of roughly 1.6 billion children and youth, including those in refugee camps, took a hit. While learning continued online in technologically advanced societies, students without access to digital connections either stayed at home while the pandemic lasted or relied on home tutoring and parental guidance during this difficult time. To promote and sustain the culture of peace, government must act proactively and creatively to redress ongoing and future imbalances in access to quality education. It is important for education to be given primary consideration in all of our efforts to build back better and stronger to ensure we truly leave no one behind. I thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I think you lay out some of the highlights, some of the challenges quite well, and also the, uh, uh, the role that member states have in order uh, to help uh, improve the chances that we can go back better and leave no one behind. Uh, next, we have a brief video message from our uh, partner, Mr. Abdulaziz Saad al Bakhtain, who is director and founder of the al Bakhtain Foundation in Kuwait, and also a longtime uh, patron of the culture of peace. Allow me to take this opportunity to thank Mr. al Bakhtain for his support and his uh, longtime friendship to IPI over the years. بسم الله الصديق العزيز تيري رود لارسن رئيس المعهد الدولي للسلام السيد تيجاني محمد باندي رئيس الجمعية العامة للأمم المتحدة السادة ممثلو الدول والسفراء وممثلو المنظمات الدولية وممثلو المجتمع المدني أرجو أن تكونوا جميعا صحة جيدة إنه ليسعدني أن أرحب بكم جميعا لمشاركتكم في هذه الندوة الافتراضية التي تأتي ضمن سلسلة الندوات التي جرت العادة أن ينظمها حضوريا المعهد الدولي للسلام بالاشتراك مع مؤسسة عبد العزيز سعود البابطين الثقافية على هامش المنتدى الدولي رفيع المستوى حول ثقافة السلام للأمم المتحدة كما أتقدم لفريق عمل المعهد بجزيل الشكر على مواصلة تنظيم هذه الدورة سنويا رغم صعوبة ظروف التواصل عالميا بسبب الوباء وأجدد ثنائي على مبادرة لجنة كومباس حول المقاربات متعددة الأطراف للأوبئة والأمن والتنمية المستدامة التي اقترح السيد لرزن أما بخصوص التعليم وكوفي 19 وثقافة السلام أود أن أبدي ملاحظتين جوهريتين الأولى هي إجماعنا على مبدأ تعميم الفائدة وأني أقصد تعميم التعليم والمعارف الأصيلة على كل بلدان العالم فقيرها وغنيها على قدم المساواة 
إذا فإن الدرس الأول الذي نتعلمه من الأزمة هو أن بعضنا في حاجة إلى بعض ذلك أن كوفيد 19 كشف لنا حاجتنا المتبادلة وضرورة أن نعمل معا لنتشارك في المعرفة والعلوم والأبحاث لا على صعيد الجانب الفردي بهدف جمع المال فقط فهذا أمر مشروع بل لنستفيد من المعرفة الفكرية المشتركة المعمقة بيننا لإيجاد العلاج للإنسانية إن المجتمعات تكون أكثر ثراء بمعارفها المعممة التي هي الجامع المشترك بينها والنتيجة النبيلة العظيمة هي أن تعميم التعليم والمعرفة وثقافة السلام العادل إنما تنتهي بنا إلى تعميم الفائدة إنه مسار مترابط أي حاجة متبادلة مشتركة أما الملاحظة الثانية هي إجماعنا على ما نسميه جميعا الترابط متعدد الأطراف كآلية بديلة عن التعاون الكلاسيكي حتى نتجاوز القطبية الأحادية والصراع بين المجموعات الاقتصادية وبذلك فإن الدرس الثاني الذي نتعلمه من هذا الوباء هو تقوية الترابط العالمي بين الدول والأمم ليكون أكثر فاعلية أساسه الفائدة المتبادلة إذا علينا أن نعيد تنظيم العالم وفق اقتصاد عالمي جماعي فالمسؤولية تقع على الاقتصادات الكبيرة في العالم لإعادة توجيه البشرية نحو العمل وتنمية قدرة مختلف المجتمعات على المشاركة في النهاية أني أعتقد أن أهم درس من كوفيد 19 هو أن نموذج العولمة السابق يجب أن نتجاوزه نحو نموذج جديد متعدد الأطراف يقوم على الترابط المعتمد أساسا على تعليم ثقافة السلام العادل هو تجمع مشترك يجمع كل الأطراف القوية والأضعف على أساس التضامن العضوي أي التضامن المستدام من أجل ترابط مستدام ومن أجل شكل جديد للعولمة حيث هو وأنا وأنتم ونحن نكون حاضرين جميعا باختلاف هويتنا وثقافاتنا ولغاتنا وأدياننا وألواننا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته okay, thank you so much, Mr. Abatain, for your commitment to the culture of peace over so many years. Uh, we have a great panel now ahead of us uh, to discuss all of these issues. I will briefly uh, introduce each each one of you, and then we'll then we'll just go right into it. So, um, first of all, we have Ambassador Rabab uh, Fatima, who is permanent representative of Bangladesh to the United Nations in New York. Previously, she was Bangladesh ambassador to Japan as well as regional representative for South Asia for the International Organization of Migration and head of human rights at the Commonwealth Secretariat in London. Next, we'll have Stefania uh, Giannini, who is the top UN official in the field of education as UNESCO's Assistant Director General for Education. She was previously the Minister of Education, Universities and Research in Italy as well as a senator and director of the University for Foreigners of Perugia. Finally, we'll hear from Robert Jenkins, who is Chief of Education and Associate Director, Program Division of UNICEF. He was previously Deputy Director of Policy and Strategy at UNICEF and has over 20 years of extensive field experience at the management and program levels in Jordan, Uganda, Bangladesh, Myanmar, India, and Mozambique. So we have a tremendous amount of experience and expertise around the table. Um, Ambassador, I know you have to sign off a little bit um, early due to a prior engagement, but we are uh, grateful for your time and leadership in uh, these um, support resources. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Lupel and my apologies right at the outset that you know I may have to leave early because I have got another engagement that I have to attend to but my colleagues will be here so if there is anything that comes up they'll be you know more than um, you know I'm sure they will be able to uh, respond to those. Um, President of the General Assembly, Vice President Adam Lupel, distinguished fellow panelists Ms. Giannini and Mr. Jenkins, uh, distinguished guests and dear friends it gives me great pleasure to join you all today and I thank IPI for giving me this opportunity to share a few thoughts. 
for me personally, the annual commemoration of the culture of peace holds special significance. As I've shared at the General Assembly meeting this morning, more than 20 years back, as a young delegate, I was part of the core team that mooted the idea of the culture of peace. It is indeed heartening to see today uh, the notion not only having emerged as a dominant theme at the UN, but also embraced by the wider international community, especially with the NGOs and the CSOs like IPI, uh, the GM Pop, uh, partnering, uh, the movement on a culture of peace and nonviolence has not only got stronger and mainstreamed in the discourse uh, of, uh, has got only stronger uh, and mainstreamed in the discourse of any global crisis. And I thank IPI for championing the cause of the culture of peace. Uh, having endured a hard fought uh, war of independence, we realized the importance of peace from the very beginning of our nationhood. In his maiden speech at the United Nations in 1974, our founding father, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujib Rahman, had said, peace is an imperative for the survival of mankind. It represents the deepest aspirations of men and women throughout the world. And that has shaped the enduring commitment of Bangladesh to the cause of global peace. That is also what inspired Bangladesh to introduce and lead uh, the GA resolution um, declaration and pro program of action on a culture of peace uh, that was adopted by the General Assembly in 1999. Uh, the declaration and program of action identified education as one of the key action areas, which eventually found reflection in Agenda 2030 under SDG 4.7 that reiterates the principle of promotion of culture of peace and nonviolence as, uh, as well as global citizenship by 2030. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, a culture of peace nurtured and promoted through education can play a catalytic role in promoting intercultural and interreligious dialogue, bridging divides and discrimination across and within societies and fostering mutual respect, peace, harmony, and tolerance. Inculcating a culture of peace should begin at a young age. In Bangladesh, our school curriculum introduces peace perspective at an early age followers of different faiths coexist in our society in harmony. Mr. Chair, the theme of today's discussion, education, COVID-19, and the culture of peace is a very timely and pertinent one. We are passing through an unprecedented crisis. The pandemic has created the largest disruption of education systems in history with severe consequences for children everywhere. The Secretary General's policy brief on education during COVID-19 and beyond gives us a sobering picture. The pandemic has affected nearly 1.6 billion students in over 190 countries. And a majority of them are in the developing world without access to connectivity and distance learning. A good majority may not be able to return to school for reasons ranging from poverty, child labor, and child marriages. As children stay out of school, there is increased exposure to violence and exploitation adversely impacting on their mental health and overall well-being. This week, the executive board of UNICEF is meeting and the overarching theme of the session is education. You will hear more about that from fellow panelists, Mr. Jenkins, uh, uh, in a short while. It is encouraging to see uh, for us that all UN ent entities, especially UNICEF and UNESCO, and other stakeholders supporting and working uh, closely with national governments in mitigating the crisis at hand. We will be hearing more about that from the other distinguished panelists uh, from UNICEF and UNESCO. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in Bangladesh, the economic stimulus package that we rolled out following the pandemic, uh, which is for about $13 billion, includes allocation for expansion of the monthly stipend program for students and cash delivery for effective families. Since March, all educational institutions had to, were locked down which helped us greatly to control the spread of the virus. Various sectors of the economy have, are gradually opening up um, to balance life and livelihood. School reopening in a safe way is under active consideration also. In order to continue education and learning during pandemic, during the pandemic, we have introduced various alternative methods. The state-run television channels are running distant learning programs for students of primary and secondary schools. Some schools are taking online classes, but these initiatives, I have to say, are very limited and many challenges remain, not only in my country, but I think globally, especially in the global, um, 
in the developing world, this is uh, very evident. Only about 30% of children from the developing world actually have access to online education. And I'm sure um, uh, our colleagues on the panel will elaborate further on that. It is therefore imperative that COVID response and recovery efforts include adequate measures and resources to ensure the right to education of all children. Both immediate and long-term response, uh, response plans and programs must be planned and undertaken to address the disruptive situation in the education sector. Uh, the pandemic exposed, as I had earlier said, the digital divide that hinders education for all. To make up for lost grounds, we can leverage the focus of culture of peace on education to review, innovate, and restructure conventional education, including in research and development. Mr. Chair, uh, distinguished delegates, national efforts of the governments in the developing world would need to be supported. International cooperation and partnership are required more than ever before to overcome gaps in education systems, especially in infrastructure, human resources and funding, and bridging the digital divide if we are to reach the SDG4, in particular for low and lower middle income countries. We do not wish to see the pandemic become a generational crisis. Mr. Chair, the culture of peace could act as a force multiplier in our pursuit. It could help bring back the much needed inclusivity in pandemic response and SDGs implementation. I thank you all once again for your attention and I thank you for this opportunity to share a few words. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank, thank you so much, Ambassador, for uh, again reminding us of the uh, extraordinary leadership of Bangladesh in the, uh, the origins of, of the uh, agenda for the culture of peace. Um, and also the important um, highlighting the connection uh, between the culture of peace now and this uh, and the sustainable development goals, both of which are holistic agendas that we need to think about uh, together. Um, I think also it, it's extremely important um, this point that you make about um, uh, the risk that the longer children are out of school, the higher uh, the risk of it that they to be exposed to various forms of of exploitation um, and and as we return to school we really have to keep an eye on um, the rights of the poorest the most vulnerable to education and so many of us are uh, turning towards online education as a solution but as you point out so many do not have that access and, well, and so it's really interesting to me the, the, the point that you made that we've seen in some other countries turning to television as, as uh, radio as a uh, potential uh, source um, and thank you. Also, I, I really like this idea of thinking the, the culture of peace uh, agenda as a force multiplier in some way to, to use it as an opportunity to think about as we go back to school and um, think about our education systems in a new way post pandemic. How can we use the culture of peace as, as a mechanism to help us to rethink about how we can transcend divisions and, and, uh, and, and all the uh, issues that fall from it? So, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, I know you'll have to leave uh, uh, early, but I really do appreciate your, your contributions uh, for now. Um, great. Um, now we turn to um, UNESCO, um, Stefania Giannini. Um, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Adam, and thank uh, the IEP, um, IPI uh, International Peace Institute for dedicating this uh, very timely meeting to the largest disruption of, uh, in education uh, we had since the creation of the UN system, and for sure, we can say in history. Well, uh, Talking about uh, culture of peace and education uh, uh, is uh, very much uh, going to straight on to the core of UNESCO mandate. UNESCO is founded on the, on the belief that the defenses of peace must be constructed in the minds of people and education is uh, a, a, an indispensable uh, tool for human dignity. Inequality, exclusion, uh, and uh, denial of human rights and democratic principles uh, weaken these defenses, for sure. And uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, has exposed uh, our interdependencies and the fragility uh, uh, to an unforeseen degree. Uh, and 
it has uh, hit the most vulnerable hardest. This is something that uh, from the very beginning we, we could see and uh, we alerted a bit the world about uh, the risk of uh, uh, increasing uh, amplified inequalities. Uh, as interrupting uh, education uh, uh, because of poverty, disability, family circumstances, or lack of access to technology, something that uh, has been already uh, suffered in many regions of the world. So our global education monitoring report uh, recently published this year uh, within the COVID pandemic estimates that 40% of poorest countries uh, failed to provide specific support to disadvantaged learners during the pandemic. And it has exposed children to increase the levels of violence and driven home the critical role that schools play in providing social protection uh, we realize that definitely that the schools are, are not simply and crucially uh, places where we learn, but are very much more than this, uh, places where there is a social protection, there is a nutrition, there is health, uh, and there is a social uh, first relationship with the rest of the world outside the family. So the pandemic has uh, unleashed a wave of fake news. This is another dimension we have to underline, hate speech, uh, xenophobia, and everything has been amplified on social media networks. At the same time, uh, this crisis has revealed also uh, some admirable acts of solidarity. I should say that solidarity can consider one of the key words on the red line of the process we are running. Uh, on the part of uh, uh, individuals from all walks of life who invented ways to break uh, isolation and, uh, and uh, somehow meet uh, basic human needs. And, uh, and uh, we have also witnessed uh, the, the, the power of governments, uh, uh, the resourcefulness of governments, uh, communities, uh, teachers first uh, to find uh, creative solutions uh, almost overnight, jumping from the traditional classroom to the virtual ones uh, in order to ensure learning continuity. I should say that uh, uh, the, 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 the main purpose of uh, us as UNESCO, but all our community, uh, I'm sure uh, Rob Jenkins uh, will take point back in his speech uh, was from the very beginning uh, uh, assuring learning continuity to all children in the world. Now we are entering uh, in, a, in, a, in a second phase, uh, the so-called new normal, uh, one that has uh, basically to bridge the fault lines that uh, have widened during this pandemic, be it economic, social, or digital. And uh, nearly now 24 million uh, additional children and youth from pre-primary, preschooling to university level are at risk of uh, dropout this year in 2020 due to the pandemic's economic impact alone. The economic shock associated with the COVID-19 crisis uh, will be a huge one, significantly the largest than uh, we, could, we saw uh, uh, of, the, of the financial crisis of 2008-9. And fiscal pressures uh, could, uh, could lead to decline in uh, education budgets at a time when uh, more resources are required to make schools uh, safe, to address uh, learning losses, to support teachers. This is a, the, the big chapter of reopening safe. And now responsibility now as an international community is really to avert uh, what the Secretary General uh, just defined, a generational catastrophe, the risk of a generational catastrophe we have in face of us. And uh, schools are reopening, but out of the um, 900 million students who are supposed to start now in the coming, in the coming weeks, uh, or this week as well in many countries, the, a new academic year, between August and mid-October, only half uh, of them have assurances they can return to full-time in-person classes. And hundreds of millions of learners will begin their new school year at home exclusively or through a hybrid model, which is a solution already 
put in practice in many countries. So, however education happens, it tends to happen on grounds that are more inclusive, caring, and geared to ensuring the learning carries value. The question of value, the question that uh, we have to relaunch the mission of the 4.7 that uh, Madam Ambassador already mentioned uh, is really very much uh, uh, to be put uh, at the very core of the recovery policy in education, building back better. And this crisis provides also an opportunity, an opportunity to reimagine education, an opportunity to build more resilient education systems that respect diversity and work for all. Cultural diversity for us is a critical point, and I think that we have the opportunity to, to push on that. Then a culture of peace is uh, intimately linked to a culture of inclusion. Uh, and this is the starting point for educational recovery, uh, pulling all this, the stops to ensure that the most marginalized children, uh, the youth return to school and learn in safe environments with special attention to girls, with special attention to refugees and conflict situations. Already before this crisis, close to half the student population was disengaged from learning. We, we know numbers, I'm going to repeat today, not acquiring fundamental uh, and the basic skills uh, after several years of schooling. And education should be uh, um, a bulwark uh, against inequality. Instead, poor quality amplifies the social divides. A long-term outlook in education is critical because uh, the returns, uh, let me say, the results uh, uh, flourish over time. Uh, let, me, let me put an example concretely. When you invest in early childhood today, for example, the benefits are reaped over a lifetime. So it's not something you can measure and you can evaluate in a, in a, in a short while. And the second point is that this crisis uh, and uh, the, the, the kind of anxiety and loss it has generated so far has also highlighted the urgency to invest more in social and emotional skills. It's a bit like uh, the more we leverage the technology and the more we have to take care of the humankind, of the human side of the, of the educational process. And these skills uh, uh, nurture empathy, awareness, uh, capacity to manage emotions, uh, and uh, also to develop uh, positive relationships. Uh, they must be mainstream throughout education systems. Still, it's about 4.7 to, uh, to be embedded in the, in the, in the curricula and uh, all the process uh, which will run in the coming months, uh, at national level, at global level as well. Finally, to reorient education systems around the culture of peace, students uh, must be wired to defend the human rights, uh, act for social justice, gender equality, and care, taking care for the environment. I think that taking care can really become some, something like, sounds like the claim of this new phase, of this new era. And UNESCO leads work uh, worldwide on education for global citizenship, as, uh, as you know, and sustainable development. These are the two, two signs of, of the same kind and also for the prevention of violent extremism. We work with youth, teachers, uh, governments, uh, and it's about integrating these principles, practices into education systems. And it's about fostering a sense of shared responsibility for the future. These are, these are really transformative principles. And uh, peace today needs these transformative skills that education can transmit and all education can transmit. For all these reasons, uh, together with UNICEF, namely, and also the larger family of education partners, just coming from another important meeting today, the Global Education Forum, where we launch the sense of, of urgency we have, uh, this big family we are honored to be member and part of is appealing to governments to prioritize education in the recovery funds, in the recovery process as a solution, as a real solution, as a force of peace and the key driver for, of all the sustainable development goals. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Stefania. It's really, really, there's a lot, a lot there. I think as you as you begin to lay out some of the challenges, I think it occurs to me something that we've been uh, talking about is that COVID-19 has, has proven to be a stress test for all kinds of systems and institutions uh, throughout the world. And, and, and education is, is one of them, but also just simply governance in the state and how we provide for those, those most um, uh, vulnerable. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's nice that you mentioned also that, that it has produced uh, certain spirits of solidarity. I mean, you see a lot of, uh, of people coming together as well to, to, try, to try to help, but it, the, the problem is so, is so large, it's difficult for that to fill, fill the gap. Um, but most important, I think, is this, is this point that you make that we're sort of entering into now this, this second phase, the, 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 the risks that we've been focused on so much up to now is, is the risks of closure, that because of, of COVID-19 schools, schools have closed, um, but now we're, we're dealing with the challenges of safely reopening and, and what, what specific challenges do those um, present. And something that comes to my mind is something that we've been discussing at IPI um, around COVID-19 is, is the extent that which if, you know, if at the beginning of this crisis, everyone was very focused on the, meta, on the medical issues. Um, and, um, but that is a crisis, it's ballooning out into concentric circles to, to impact so many other different areas. And if you might say, as a vaccine is on the horizon, we're, we're maybe near the end of the, be of the beginning of this crisis, we're, we're nowhere near the beginning of the end. And in part, that's because it's having ripple effects. And so you mentioned, yes, uh, we're, we're now looking to reopen, but it's not just about uh, reopening in a safe way. It's also about reopening in a sufficient way at a time when, because of the economic impacts, you have you know, fiscal crises that are the risk of reducing education budgets. Um, you have people that maybe it's safe for them to go back to school, but because of economic demands, they're not, they're gonna drop out because they have to enter into the, the labor market and, uh, and such. So there's all these other all second order, order risks that we need to in the international community start paying, paying more attention to. Um, um, and um, um, I, and you, I, I really, it really struck me this point that you made that you know, education ideally should be a bulwark against inequality. But these economic demands show suggest that the, the risk that that our education systems will end up reinforcing inequalities as opposed to to, um, to be a bulwark against them is, is increased in, in this context. So something that we all need. I'll turn it over to you, Robert. Robert, please. Thank you very much, um, Adam, and Your Excellency, and my dear friend, Stefania. Th um, you know, uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. I just fully support what my fellow, the distinguished panelists have, uh, have mentioned already. And I think I'll just build on those comments, which are fully support and do a little more deep diving into some of the uh, issues that we see are taking place in various countries. But also, Adam, like you were just mentioning, I think um, I really appreciate that. And um, both the panelists have mentioned the urgency and the challenges and the urgency for action. And in a way, I think we could see this almost as a race that is currently undergoing. And that is a race between the challenges that children are facing and uh, potential uh, pitfalls like not returning to school, which is in the tens of millions, uh, potentially if we don't all work together and, uh, and collectively proactively reach the most marginalized and bridge them back. These are, is one side of the race, the other is, can we indeed meet their needs before the implications are irreversible? Let me talk a little bit more about that. But um, I do think while we recognize those, uh, those very significant challenges, I think we do have an opportunity. I think we have potentially a once in a generation opportunity now to reopen schools in a new way to relook at schools and the critical role they play and to support uh, schools and, and education systems to maximize uh, the potential to transform learning that we have now. Let me, and obviously is at the heart of um, the discussion around peace and everyone is making the very clear and real linkage between education and the roles that schools can play and peace. Um, so how can we maximize this reopening process 
so that um, it has a, the most positive impact on peace that, that it could potentially have. Um, we are strongly advocating for schools to be prioritized in the reopening process and all actions to be taken for uh, and measures to be taken so that schools open safely. So um, while societies are open, we'd like schools to be amongst the first in the, in the, in the list and uh, prioritized and all actions to be taken for them to open. And that indeed is a race because we have seen in previous school closures, including extended school closures as a result of Ebola, the longer schools are closed, the more um, vulnerable children become and the more at risk of dropping out and never returning to their learning. So it is a race that schools must reopen and actions need to be taken for them to be safe. Three main uh, messages on when a, when a country decides to reopen, we engage on three key issues around reopening. One, focus on reaching the most vulnerable. Number two, transform the way learning is provided, recognizing the world was experiencing a learning crisis before the pandemic and has been exacerbated. So we need to reopen the schools and teach in a different way and deliver the curriculum a different way. And third, meet the holistic needs of children. And I'm glad Her Excellency and Stefania have mentioned and you, Adam, mentioned that uh, social emotional health, nutrition support, health support, uh, protection um, are all critical um, support systems and services that are provided at schools that are going to become increasingly important. So three main messages. So a lot is um, happening at, at country level to realize uh, interventions that meet those three areas. Let me just focus on a few on reaching the most vulnerable. In Brazil, we see um, there's uh, very proactive work on an out of school um, search strategy, literally at community level, identifying at risk children, working together to bridge them back into school. Uh, Burkina Faso, a very large scale awareness campaign around the importance of girls education, and enabling girls to come back. And that's also recognizing adolescent girls are particularly disadvantaged and at risk of, of dropping out. In Burkina Faso, also more support was provided for meals in schools for the most vulnerable and leveraging the school system to meet the holistic needs of kids. Um, in Tanzania, a lot of work with between uh, UNESCO, um, ourselves and UNICEF and UNHCR to uh, work with children living in refugee camps in, in the country and see how, again, schools can be leveraged to provide clean water and sanitation facilities but also that there are enough learning spaces um, and, and expanding infrastructure so that the most vulnerable could bridge back into school. But so they enter and there's a, let's say a wide open door in the school and there's a welcome mat for all that, that these type of interventions are helping. How can we maximize the impacts? So let me move to this second around learning and um, indeed promoting peace and understanding uh, of diversity within schools. A lot of interventions are taking place, really exciting in various countries, like in Nicaragua, um, we're working closely with UNESCO and ourselves to provide recreation kits for students that focus specifically on their social emotional skills through play as they come back, recognizing that kids haven't played in many countries for months, um, including Adam, you were mentioning your own child, my children too. Although I do try to step up and like substitute as a friend, I just do not seem to be as effective as their actual friends. Um, so uh, those type of um, uh, interventions are taking place. In, I mentioned Nicaragua and other countries in El Salvador, similar region, um, a lot of work around um, how do children, as they bridge back, uh, have an opportunity to express themselves and teachers are better skilled now at in, a, in recognizing the traumatic situation many children have faced with this disruption and, and enabling them to, to bridge back to school. Um, there's been some inter, in a lot of different interventions at country level to, around uh, working with parents and providing parents the education sort of skills if you'd like or ways of of coaching their children and supporting their children both on learning but also as they prepare and bridge back to school in myanmar in uh there was um translation of of materials for parents into 25 different ethnic languages to support children uh to, sorry to support parents to support children as they come back um to school including 
with the all, um, all sort of pervasive now levels of stress that children are facing. And actually, I saw an interesting statistic this morning for the first time, uh, based on a partner that we work with in the Middle East, that 80% of children in four countries in the Middle East that are, that are in challenging situation, I served there just before this position, 80% of children rank uh, the COVID-19 as their number one concern at the moment. And these are children that are living in, in often in living in very challenging search, uh, circumstances. Refugees were uh, a key part of that cohort that was interviewed. And it just goes to show that um, children are indeed facing very real stress and schools need to be leveraged to, uh, to deal with, with that. Um, and again, interventions are taking place. Let me just wrap up by uh, by saying I think, and Stefania uh, I know speaks to this uh, very uh, frequently also, but the importance of reimagining education, and she's mentioned it now, and this disruption gives us an opportunity to indeed not, I do feel there's been an increased recognition of the importance of schools that play in communities by parents, by decision makers. I also think there's a recognition that as the schools were closed and now are reopening, we have, a, we have an opportunity to reimagine how that front door is open in a school and what happens behind that door. And um, I fear that if we do not, and the challenges you've mentioned, uh, Adam and Stefania mentioned also around financing, if we can't overcome issues like ensuring adequate resources for the reopening process, but also for the transformation over the short, medium and long term that is now required um, due to understandably the contracted uh, economies, the pre fiscal pressure that the governments are facing. But we are all, at least in the education sector, we are all kind of hands on deck reemphasizing the importance of that. Um, I have an ill pet too, so that's what you're hearing in the background, but I'm just going to, uh, I'll end there um, and thank you very much for the opportunity. I look forward to the continued discussion. Great, thank you, Robert. No, that's, that's super, super helpful. And I think that you, you provide some really concrete examples there, um, um, delivering on your, your three messages and focus, need to focus on the most vulnerable uh, opportunities tra to transform learning and the need to meet the holistic needs of, of students in this context. I think that's a really, really helpful way to frame it and, and really concrete uh, examples from Brazil, from the past, or Tanzania, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Myanmar. The, the point in Myanmar, by the way, I think was is really interesting in, um, in how you frame it, the, the need to support parents to support children. Um, but I say it's a good segue because we got, we, we've got a few questions and one of them is, uh, uh, is from a, a, a mother from Brooklyn, Mima Spadolo, Brooklyn, New York. And I, and I say it's a, it's a good segue to me because, um, you know, at IPI, we talk about international issues and this is a, this is, this is a global issue. But of course, you know, I've come to this, this conversation as a parent with very, a very local prism. And way too often, I think in the developed world, we, we think of we're providing the lessons for, for abroad. Um, and uh, Ms. Spadola asks, um, kind of turns it around. She asks, she says, here in New York City, uh, nearly three quarters of our public school students live in poverty, with schools switching to remote learning last year. And now students are able to choose between partial in-school attendance or remote. What lessons does the work of UNICEF and UNESCO internationally provide uh, to help us in New York understand how we can best attend to our, our most at risk students? Um, and, uh, um, and one, if I could just answer one question, based upon what you said about Myanmar, as a parent, I, could, I would say, you know, parents could use a lot, a lot, more, uh, a lot more help. Um, but but it, maybe to, to each of you, is there, in, in your experience in UNESCO and UNICEF, how, how do you see those lessons that you are um, learning in, in more fragile context uh, applicable in, uh, in the develop, developing world? I mean, the developed world or in, um, in the US, Europe and elsewhere. Stefani, do you wanna, do you wanna jump in there or, yeah? Thank you, just, just briefly. Uh, I mean, uh, just reflecting a bit uh, on the difference between these, these crises 
kind mm. of this unprecedented uh, pandemic or, you know, big uh, events which had already a, a strong impact uh, on education, for instance, the Ebola crisis, no? which affected some countries in the sub syrian region and uh, dropout uh, girls especially was one of the clear, already uh, well quantified consequences. But now I think uh, the, the real uh, big difference of this crisis this is the first time that globally, from the north to the south, every single citizen realized the importance of schools, the importance of, uh, uh, and, and the fragility of the system. I mean, because uh, overnight, uh, globally, uh, school system had shut down. Uh, we, we, we started to monitor uh, at the end of March and in a few days, uh, the peak reached 1.6 billion students. So the first lesson is that facing a real global challenge, there is a need of uh, uh, sharing practices to uh, you know, build this, uh, I, I mentioned solidarity. Solidarity means completely to build a platform where not only the international organizations as provider of uh, and supporters uh, uh, of giving uh, solutions to governments, but all uh, you know, ministers, the, the, the community of educators uh, could find a new way of working together and facing the same challenge from this perspective. So I think these, these two lessons have been already learned. And uh, I hope that, and this is very much about linked to the question of uh, also the mission of the IPI, I mean, the, the question that uh, through education, uh, by education is possible to build another kind of uh, relationship between, uh, uh, between countries also, not to be simply be between individuals. So I, I hope that this is a turning point that uh, uh, will not uh, uh, allow us to go back to, to, to the past. Uh, and the second and last lessons learned, uh, Robert has already mentioned very well these two points, the role of uh, uh, community and families, uh, which you know, usually we don't consider to be uh, really within the constituency of education. No? There is a, a traditional boundary between uh, the, the, the school community and what, what we find outside, including family and parents that sometimes, especially in the, in the north of the world are a bit, uh, you know, uh, the other side of the river, they are the counterpart and not uh, the same part of the same mission. And we learned that uh, parents, families, communities have a strong role uh, in, uh, in educational process. And I think that it's another very important uh, legacy we don't have to, to, to lose. Over. Adam, I'll just compliment what uh, Stefania is saying. I think at school level, um, which is, I mean, I think the key is first of all, set a goal and the school has to be very open and with the parents and with teachers and with the principal and with the superintendents in the case of the next level up in many countries, the goal is for all children to be back in school and even potentially with the reopening of school, find children that weren't in school before. Even can we take this opportunity to even access children that were never in school before? So first of all, very clear community level, all children back in school. Then secondly, which children are at risk? Which children, um, understanding and measuring and proactively identifying those children that are struggling either with access to make it back or once they come back their needs are not met and that is very individualized and that requires investment and tools to understand the the context that each child is facing and, and enable those to be addressed and we see countries doing very proactively doing that but it requires local solutions um, so that's second and third, it's engagement, engagement, engagement. I think process, and Stefania has mentioned this um, with parent engagement, I think 
countries that have been most successful in reopening schools, success meaning to not have to then reclose, uh, reclose but also um, children uh, were able to return success, are those that had very significant engagement processes involving students themselves, teachers, parents, administrators, etc. So very heavily t invest in, in communication and engagement uh, opportunities now is critically important. Great, thank you. I think th those are obviously, obviously very transferable lessons. I mean, to, to, to make sure all children are in school, even those that maybe weren't in school before, uh, identify the children most at risk. Um, uh, and the need to be proactive, I think, you know, it doesn't just happen. It really does uh, need to be proactive and, and, and engagement, engagement, engagement. That's, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that. That's really, really helpful. Um, I have uh, a couple more uh, questions. One actually is, is, is right back to you, Robert. And this comes from um, Zimbabwe, from Wadizor Rakato, who is a, um, uh, actually was a, um, was a, uh, the, um, African Scholars Fellow. She asks, um, you, you mentioned um, the personal emotional development of youth and she asked, does UNICEF have evidence um, and data on the positive impacts of, of online experiential education um, that focuses on the personal and emotional development of youth during COVID? Um, is there, is, there, is there data on any on that? Is that, is that possible? She says, in, um, especially in vulnerable contexts where education resources are already stretched. Um, I guess it's a question of really what, is, uh, what do we know about, um, about the impact of online uh, education on, on this question of personal and emotional development? Has there, has there been studied? Do we, do we know about that? Uh, in the I'm, I really appreciate the question. I think it's very, very important because not only is it very important now during, um, as, as Stefania mentioned, we still have nearly a billion children not in school, but also, so can we meet their most social emotional needs through remote uh, tools, but also as we plan reopening too and looking at blended learning and increasingly the value of IT and the impact of IT enabled tools in classrooms, what indeed is the impact? Um, my uh, simple answer, and, but I'd be interested to hear Stefania's comments on this too, but is, and, and sadly it's going to be unsatisfactory, the evidence is mixed. And it's mixed because it depends on the tool, it depends on the context. And I think it's almost an unfair question to try and isolate the specific impact of an IT-enabled tool on the social emotional uh, needs and well-being of children, recognizing that that's a much broader, um, I mean, the, the, how children can be social emotionally healthy um, is going to relate to many more things beyond just their um, IT enabled tool. Now, having said that, there are some very exciting innovations that are IT enabled that do indeed contribute and target social emotional health and successfully there is some evidence that shows that they can successfully have a positive impact. It comes to attributes like the um, the, the context specificity, um, how relevant the content is to each context, um, and and being very sensitive to the content, to the context and and. When I say context, it doesn't necessarily mean a country. It can mean at subnational level. It can it can mean a, um, uh, types of languages, the way issues are portrayed. It's also um, more tools that are more interactive than one way. And maybe that's stating the obvious, but still, many IT enabled tools are relatively um, top down, relatively supply oriented. So those that enable interaction, enable questioning, enable engagement are more effective. Um, those are what is my understanding of, of the evidence to date. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Of course, then it raises the issue as we talked earlier that one of the solutions for the lack of access to online is of course to use radio and TV, which is not interactive. Right? Um, I do just um, want to come back yeah. to the radio for one second. Yeah, yeah, Stefania, sure, you've heard this fave before, but we had some fun, very interesting data from a country in West Africa that, that based on a, not a huge survey, but it's somewhat representative that said children, um, younger children that were, that were learning using the radio found it more personalized than the teaching they were receiving in their school.
And the logic, I think, there being is a very high quality programming with teaching, like on, and because it was from the radio and it seemed very personalized, if done very well, I think it can be felt like the teacher is speaking directly to you. But it's obviously not, it's maybe somewhat individual or you feel it is, but it's obviously not interactive. But it was, it was a fascinating uh, sort of indication of what's possible, even through the radio. Great, great. So, I want to get you in here and you can respond to some of this, but also we've got one, uh, um, Mr. Rucato of Zimbabwe also has a specific question for you as well um, on peace education. You, you mentioned uh, this principle of solidarity and also the, the education as a tool to bridge divisions. She asked, what, what specific strategies can be applied for better embedding this kind of approach? Um, as we rethink uh, education, um, uh, as we reopen schools and such, what, what, what sort of specific strategies does UNESCO uh, apply to that? I think that uh, the point I, I, I summarize a bit to touch upon in, in my presentation, uh, the, the two sides of 4.7, 4 just to, to, to go back to the target of uh, of uh, one of the, the targets of, uh, of SDG4 uh, is really very much about uh, developing uh, more and better than in the past of these two, two, two dimensions, global citizenship and education for sustainable development. And this is about uh, um, curriculum uh, uh, developing, it's about uh, prioritizing these topics in, term of in terms of content, I mean, uh, at curriculum level, but it's also about, let me say, uh, just looking at, uh, at uh, the lessons already learned in this crisis, uh, uh, taking the opportunity of, uh, you know, uh, valorizing, optimizing some kind of uh, new, uh, new social, uh, uh, networks uh, and uh, and uh, valorizing that these these uh, solutions that uh, beyond technologies uh, uh, students uh, and teachers had uh, discovered uh, as as, a, as a, their own tools uh, in order to face uh, the challenge of not being able to 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 see each other to live in a physical classroom. So it's not only about uh, uh, content and the curriculum development, which is a very important uh, strategy that UNESCO and, and, uh, and uh, is, 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 is running uh, since uh, the, the launching of the, of the 2030 agenda, but it's part, as I said, uh, uh, of the core mandate of UNESCO since the establishment of the organization. But now it's really very much about the how. It's very much about uh, uh, methodologies and uh, compensating a bit uh, these uh, social phys physical distancing with not social distances, but uh, a new kind of a social uh, networking. And I think that, for instance, uh, the way some teachers uh, organize the virtual classroom is a very interesting one. It's about, for instance, personalizing special, uh, special uh, educational uh, um, uh, pr processes for children with disabilities. This is something that uh, sometimes technology can allow you to do better than in the, in the physical classroom uh, and the physical space of learning. And it's about, uh, um, well, in, you know, valorizing innovation that uh, maybe uh, is, uh, is one of the positive side of this, uh, of this uh, disruption of education that we are living within. And I think that uh, uh, on this basis, uh, uh, still, if we can uh, uh, convince uh, in the near future, in the coming weeks, uh, political leaders to prioritize education as a public sector and then invest in uh, funds on, on that or on innovation, not only reopening in terms of uh, uh, giving uh, uh, resources to, 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 to open doors uh, of schools, but to, to see what uh, behind the doors will be uh, rethought, re reimagined, and, and uh, developed to, uh, differently. I think that it's a, it's a part of the process that uh, we, can, uh, we can really uh, you know, uh, 
start in a, in a different way. Yeah. Um, we only have a few more minutes. I mean, I feel like we could, we could talk a lot about so much of this, but I've got sort of two questions here um, that I, that if I'll just sort of paraphrase them in, in, into a question. They're, they're sort of comments, but they're similarly related. One is from, from Tunisia, from uh, Raoul Riahi, and one is from Jude Nibu, but I don't think he says where he's from. But they both have similar questions about um, what I would call the, the urban-rural divide. That part of the, part of the, the, the problem is, is that many, many governments, education systems are uh, centralized. Um, and the needs of urban students and rural students are, are, are so different. And a lot of these issues that we talk about connectivity and all this is, is very different in the urban space and the rural space. Um, so I would just pose it as a question: What 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 strategies? How can we how can we incorporate that into uh, the reopening reopening plans? I mean, th there's a tendency, as, as you say, you know, governments have to commit; we have to reinvest. But it's it's a real challenge because as as uh, um, Stefani, you, you mentioned budgets are being cut. Um, what 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 can would what is UNESCO? What is UNICEF uh, doing about these these divisions within not just individuals, the most vulnerable, but also at the national level, urban rural clusters uh, and how we can cater education policies to that effect. So why don't why don't we go in reverse order, Robert? Why don't you give us your final final thoughts and then and then we'll go to Stefania. Well, thanks. I'll be very brief. Um, and Stefania mentioned that percentage of countries that, um, you know, there are the percentage of children that have not been reached uh, during this period. And, and the rural urban divide is one piece of that indeed. And we're finding children in remote locations are, uh, more, are more disadvantaged during this period because of lack of access, because of um, often living in, in vulnerable and disadvantaged areas. So it requires concerted effort. It requires um, increasing resources to target vulnerable areas. And it also requires when basically looking at the individual needs of each area, including in rural versus or compared to urban and overcoming those at local level with the goal of enabling all children to return. So really, I come back to the earlier point, which is context specific solutions with a goal overall of all children coming back and having their needs met in schools. Um, let me just sum up by thanking uh, you, Adam, thanking IPI. Great working with you again, Stefania, as a fellow panelist and Her Excellency, and um, really appreciate this opportunity. And um, again, we work so closely, uh, UNESCO, UNICEF, um, together and other agencies. This The challenge is enormous. I do think the opportunity is equally uh, once in a generation, and um, it's really um, an appeal for engagement and support with all your listeners and supporters of IPI in this journey as we move forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Stefania, please, final words. Just briefly from my side, uh, I would like to, to refer to the framework that we published together with Rob uh, and, uh, and the World Bank, our colleague Andy Saavedra. Recently, it's about uh, reopening schools. And one of the principles you can find there is that uh, I summarize like this, one size for all doesn't work in this context. And uh, the more you can uh, adopt uh, solutions which are contest oriented, the better it is for you know, uh, reaching the goal of uh, uh, addressing the specific challenges. So this is the, 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 the model uh, we suggest to, to, to be adopted by governments and ministries. And that's the, the job we are doing together in order to, to support them. And to summarize, looking for some key words, uh, uh, engagement, uh, you mentioned, solidarity, you mentioned, partnership, the last one. I think uh, what we need now is really to, to, to strong, strongly work together. We are doing a big effort from the international organization side, I think unprecedented in my opinion, in terms of uh, uh, you know, uh, integrating uh, all our competency expertise in a one common mission, which is about uh, uh, continue to learn it, but it's also about uh, uh, assuring education as a basic human right. What we are doing, what we are discussing, what we are working together is about that. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, at the end for me of a long day, Rob, you are still something to do, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's a great pleasure. It's been a great pleasure as usual. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Really, really been uh, a really fascinating conversation that I feel we could, we could continue
continue on. And I think one of the things, one of the take the takeaway that I uh, grabbed from this conversation is, is that the, the challenges are tremendous. I had said in my opening, one billion students. You said one point six billion. It just it just grows, and there really is this this real risk of this becoming a generational uh, issue problem. Um, but Robert kept mentioning the once in a generation opportunity that this presents. And, and in some sense, it, it, it provides me with hope, not because you need this disaster in order to provide an opportunity, but because what this disaster highlights is issues that existed pre before COVID. It, it sheds light on so many issues that needed to be addressed before. And one can hope that this can mobilize people to take action to address these long standing issues that many people in the education field have been, have been ringing the alarm bells on for, for, for quite a long time. And also that what it does in some way, you know, it seems to me as I, as a, a, a New York parent and look at the you know, experiences in Brazil and Zimbabwe and Tunisia and such, have a lot in common um, with the challenges. And so uh, if shared experiences can build solidarity, that can also mobilize action to, to, to make change. And uh, so that really um, fills me with, um, with some, some form of optimism if we can at the time. Uh, thank you again so much for everyone uh, who participated. Thank you, Stefania. Thank you, Robert, and uh, um, Ambassador Patrick.